So let's come to today's topic. Uh, today's topic is uh, backward compatibility. And uh, uh, I, I got interested in this topic some time back, but uh, the research, uh, because the backward compatibility has such a extensive history, the research uh, related to that was uh, quite, uh, quite a lot. In fact, only today morning I published the article on backward compatibility, but even then the article is not complete. I need to do a little bit more work on the historical aspects of the backward compatibility. So we'll talk about uh, related terms as well today. Uh, there are other terms like forward compatibility, upward compatibility, downward compatibility, and uh, don't think that all these terms are very well defined. Even in the industry, people are uh, using them interchangeably. So there is no consensus uh, how these should be defined. But at least for backward and forward compatibility, there is a wide understanding or more or less a consensus what these uh, terms actually mean. There is less of a consensus when it comes to upward and downward, downward compatibility. But I will attempt to give a definition of that from a reliable source. So let's uh, start. Uh, I'll share my screen and then uh, we can get started. So the thing about backward compatibility is uh, technology, as you know, is not uh, static. It is always evolving. Today we have something, tomorrow a new version of the technology will come out. So because of the evolving nature of technology, uh, there, there is always a case that in the real world, many different versions of the technology or even many different technologies coexist at the same time. And beyond coexisting, they have to also interwork with each other. So one uh, version of the technology or a product maybe has to interwork with an older version of the same product. So backward compatibility is exactly what guarantees this. That means when a new version comes out, how well, uh, I mean, does it, uh, how, how well does it replace the older version? And all the clients that used to work with the older version, will they continue to work with the newer version? So that is what backward compatibility is all about. Yeah. So we'll get into the details of the definition, but this is broadly what uh, backward compatibility means. And why is this important? Because when a new version comes out, you cannot simply ask uh, all the users of the current version to dump uh, their current products and upgrade to the new one. Either you have, uh, you, they can be told either to upgrade or to, come, to buy the new version. But economically, uh, that is not a viable solution. People will not be uh, so keen to do frequent upgrades or frequently buy new versions of products. So what it means is that whatever people have in their uh, pockets, that should interwork with the newer technologies. So that is what uh, backward compatibility. So from a personal experience, I will share you uh, this application. So some of us may be using this application. This is called Signal. So Signal is like a, it's a communication app, uh, very similar to WhatsApp. And I started using Signal maybe a year, year and a half. Uh, back uh, you know when there was some concern about uh, how uh, data is being shared between whatsapp and facebook so some of the people in my network migrated to signal now the uh, so signal is a mobile app but there is also a application desktop application uh, which i have installed on my windows system now the problem with this desktop application is almost every few days there will be an update which will be available so you have to keep uh, downloading this update. Uh, you know, it's it's not even an incremental update. Every few days you have to download the entire package and replace the existing installation. After a few iterations, it becomes a really uh, annoying to the user. That is how I felt, uh, you know, when I constantly get this uh, notification. But that's fine. I, I can continue to use the product for one or two weeks even without uh, making this update. But one final day, let's say after three or four weeks, this red message comes up. So this says that this version of Signal Desktop has expired. Please upgrade to the latest version to continue messaging. 
So why is it uh, they have done it like this? The reason for that is the server side, the API has been changed in such a way that it is no longer backward compatible. Meaning that my client desktop app, which used to work with the previous version of the server, now no longer works with that version. Because it's not been, the server has not been evolved in a backward compatible manner, which is why now my signal desktop can no longer be used or at least that is how the developers have intended it. It can no longer be used and the only way for me to use it is to upgrade to the new version of the signal app. So this is just one example. Uh, what kind of problems can happen in, in the real world if you don't design your apps to be backward compatible? In this particular example, it's not a big, uh, I mean, it's not a critical problem because uh, I may simply decide, OK, uh, let me upgrade. Uh, it's, it's not going to take more than a minute to do this upgrade. So I may not be uh, you know, too bothered about this. But then imagine that this kind of an update is uh, asked by the user every uh, few weeks. Then uh, Signal has, and Signal probably will use, lose their user base. Users probably will start losing interest in using the product. So that uh, so we have to look at uh, look at it from that perspective as well. So backward compatibility is not just about the technology or the interoperability between products, but it's also about uh, you know uh, customer satisfaction. So this is one example. I'm sure uh, there are so many other examples that people can think of. Uh, and I think we'll have a discussion on that. But before that, I want to touch upon what are the things or what uh, technology layers are impacted by backward compatibility. So backward compatibility is not just software. It also uh, applies to hardware. For example, when you design a hardware, uh, you design headers and the headers have a certain pin layout and uh, every pin has a certain function. Now, when peripherals connect to that particular uh, hardware, let's say a, a motherboard or something like that, they will uh, connect via those headers. And these headers typically are the interfaces to uh, interfaces between two hardware components. And uh, you, these interfaces need to be typically backward compatible. In fact, pin compatible is the actual term. So what it means is that even if the hardware evolves to a newer version, Existing peripherals still still can still connect to the newer version of the hardware. So that is what uh, we mean by backward compatible for hardware. But it goes beyond just uh, you know interfaces like headers, pin headers, and stuff like that. Even hardware protocols can be evolved in a backward compatible manner. So when I talk about protocols, uh, what I'm talking about is uh, way clocks are synchronized base signal levels like the voltages and the timing uh, between high and low. So way, way that kind of an hardware protocol is evolved, that can also be defined to be backward compatible. So that is from a hardware perspective. Obviously, software is also uh, needs to be backward compatible. And uh, software uh, today, software is rarely a monolith, correct? So a lot of software is built from uh, multiple components and many of them may be uh, public open source components. So backward compatibility is even more essential for today's uh, the way software is being built today. Beyond hardware and software, of course, at a system level, backward compatibility is important. And uh, an example of that is newer hardware should support older software. So a simple example of this is I buy a your laptop, it should be able to run Windows 10. I may not uh, uh, be keen to run Windows 11, but on an older hardware, it should some uh, be still be able to run Windows 10. So that is backward compatible from that perspective. But the reverse is also true. What do I mean by reverse? Uh, the newer software should also be able to run on older hardware. So that is backward compatibility from a different perspective. Then we look at API layers. So we already spoke about how modern software is built. It's uh, you know built from multiple components, uh, but some of these components could be residing on the cloud. And you call the APIs to invoke those features or functionality uh, to enhance the 
service offering of the product. So now these API layers uh, are not static. Today the API may be doing you know 10 features. Tomorrow two more features will be added. So the evolution of the API layer also needs to be done in a backward compatible manner. Why is this important? Because when you upgrade the API on the server side, the clients are not going to immediately upgrade. The clients for a long time they may continue to use the continue to use the older version of the interface. But doesn't it doesn't mean that the clients uh, all the clients are uh, suddenly broken? They should still be able to interact with the new API new version of the API layer uh, without any problems, even though they have not upgraded on their side. So this is exactly what is broken in the signal app we are talking about, right? Because at the API layer, uh, it's no longer backward compatible. But uh, so that is specifically for API layer. But if you take it more generally, any kind of a standard, whether it's ISO standard or IEEE standard, when these standards evolve, they are always evolved in a backward compatible manner. So later I'll show you an example of uh, how uh, we can do this. One of the other important aspects uh, uh, where this applies is that is at the data layer. So data which is stored or encoded let's say in an old format that should suddenly not become obsolete. Uh, that is to say there are no readers available to read that data. So uh, I remember uh, long back, uh, I think this was in 2000, there was a Y2K bug and there was a lot of, uh, if you remember, there is a lot of uh, rumors and a lot of even articles on blogs saying that uh, when the new year hits, all systems will there will be a lot of systems crashing a lot of systems will fail to work so i was uh, so on the day, uh, night of the the new year i was taking backups of all my data because at that time i was a student i was doing my masters so i had a lot of simulation data a lot of other kind of data so i was taking backups and all that and i took all those backups in a kind of a disk drive that time it was uh, the, the disk drive was called zip drive i don't know how many of you use that kind of a drive it was like uh, having a 25 times the storage capacity of a 1.44 inch uh, floppy drive floppy disk so but the thing is so at that time it was probably the largest storage available zip drive but after 5 years that zip drive itself became obsolete and I could not find any reader on the market which could read the disk. So uh, that is uh, one example of, you know, that is not exactly data layer. It relates to, you know, hardware devices as well. But uh, yeah, so, so uh, the zip drive was not like floppy drive. It was something else like it was uh, something else. It is uh, thicker. Wow. And, uh, it's about the same size as a floppy drive, maybe okay. uh, 10, uh, 20 percent. Uh, larger but it was wow. a thicker uh, drive mm -hmm. and the reader is also specially built for that oh yeah nice. but i don't think the zip drive uh, ever made it to india or never became widely used in india mm -hmm. but i was at the time living in singapore uh, studying in the university so they had all the latest uh, gadgets in the university labs yeah, mm -hmm. I, has, mm -hmm. I have seen uh, something called uh, I Omega zip drive. Yeah, we had used uh, uh, somewhere around the same time, like 2000s or 2001 to. Yeah, uh, yeah. Now the same story repeats uh, even today. I have a lot of backups uh, in uh, CD-ROM drives. But my current laptop doesn't have a CD-ROM reader, CD reader. So none of those things nice. can be used, right? Unless I uh, uh, buy a legacy uh, CD drive and then migrate all this to a different kind of a storage, like a pen drive or something like that. So that is at the data layer. But here, when I talk about backward compatibility at data layer, specifically, I'm talking about how files are encoded and decoded. And uh, this also applies to database schemas. Database schemas also have to be evolved in a backward compatible manner. So these are all so backward compatibility is not something that is uh, just limited to software. 
the way people generally understand backward compatibility. It applies across the technology spectrum, hardware, software, system level, API level, protocols, data layer, database schemas. So it applies at uh, all levels. So let's take some examples. Uh, after this, you can also share your own examples. So let's take an example of Raspberry Pi. This is the first Raspberry Pi model A and B. And this particular Raspberry Pi had 26 pins. As you can see here, this is the pin layout. Now, over the span of uh, uh, 10 to 15 years, Raspberry Pi has evolved. Today, one of the latest models is Raspberry Pi 4 model B. And this has 40 pins. Now the question is, is this backward compatible with this? And the answer is yes, because if you notice the first 26 pins of this, the functions of the pins have not been changed. So these 26 pins have exactly the same functions as the original Raspberry Pi. We have not changed the functions. You can look at the color coding, but you will notice that some of the pins have changed. So there are some pins here which are white, 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 white. And this has become red here. This white has become black. This has become black. This white has become black. So now let's study these particular changes. In Raspberry Pi 1, all the white pins here are DNC, means do not connect. Basically, it means that this pin is unused in this particular version of uh, Raspberry Pi, which is good because actually they have thought about this and said that this may be used in a future version. So currently it is unused which is exactly what has happened in a future version. They have taken this pin and assigned it to uh, 5 volts. They have taken this DNC, assigned it to ground. They have taken this DNC, assigned it to 3.3 volts and so on. So typically these do not connect pins of the earlier version now are used for either VCC or for ground. So that is how the new design is backward compatible with the old design. What it means, suppose you had some peripherals which are connecting to this particular model. The same peripherals will continue to work with this model. Because uh, that peripheral will ignore this particular pin because anyway it was designed as do not connect. So peripheral will ignore all signals on this pin. And uh, in the new version, this is simply a ground and uh, VCC. So it doesn't really matter. Okay. So this is how uh, the pin configuration of Raspberry Pi has been made backward compatible. Let's take another example. Uh, Microsoft Office. So now we are talking about the backward compatibility at the data layer. Microsoft Office 2007 uh, introduced new formats. Many of us are familiar with this DocX and uh, Spreadsheet X. So these new formats are essentially based on XML. But you see older versions of Office, they used a different format, completely different format, uh, which was uh, binary, dot, uh, doc and XLS for formats. So what is backward compatibility here? The new Office 2000 can also read and write doc and XLS files. So it's not that Office 2000 can only work with the new formats. No, it can also work with the older formats. So that way we say that Office 2007 uh, with the respect to the data, it is backward compatible. Okay. Now lay, uh, take cellular standards. So these are all standards uh, similar to what we call 3G, 4G and uh, 5G. So CDMA 2000 uh, had new, uh, newer versions, uh, data only and data and voice. So these newer versions have been designed or defined in such a way that they can interwork with the older versions, older standards. So CDMA 2001X, CDMA 1. So this is an example of backward compatibility uh, from the telecom world. The same can be said with uh, 3G, 4G and 5G. So uh, let's say your Airtel network is, uh, is has been upgraded to 4G completely. But it doesn't mean that. Uh, uh, no, that's not the right example. Let's say you are having a 2G phone. Uh, so the 2G phone, well, in, yeah, it's the right example. 2G phone can also interwork with the 4G network. 
so that is an example of backward compatibility uh, in that kind of cellular system now let's come to another as aspect from a software perspective this actually i experienced uh, because i remember long back i asked the community to donate some raspberry pi models so one of them actually gave me a model 1a which is one of the oldest models and on this model 1a the interesting thing is you can take the latest 32 bit raspberry pi os and load it on this model and it will still work so that is the beauty of backward compatibility so and even the latest version of software can work with the oldest hardware so now let's have some discussion uh, maybe you guys have some examples of backward compatibility from your experience so you can share or if you have any questions you can ask yeah i observed recently microsoft you know uh, uh, word document yeah uh, which was actually edited by you know office 2019 okay was opened by you know office 2007 I was yeah. surprised. How does that happen? Yeah, because this it's the same format, no? Is it isn't it the same format? Both no, the nineteen two thousand nineteen format is opened by two thousand seven, which is a older software. Yeah, software may be older, but uh, uh, that may be a simpler thing because both are saved saved in the same format. The format has not changed. Docx. I. Thought it a format could have changed evolved to you know 2019. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Or maybe they are supporting. Yeah, you know, continuing with the uh, with this example uh, I spoke about. Uh, let's go back to Office 2003, which was the earlier version. Do you think 2003 will be able to open DocX? I suppose it will not. Yeah, you are right. It will not. But this is where Microsoft did something interesting. they released a patch, patch. for 2003 oh. if you apply that patch 2003 will be able to open docx okay okay so which means you know they are making sure that you know latest so, format also yeah, will hold hold upgrade path for people who don't want to upgrade to 2007 but want to work with the newer formats right thank you so that is another way of you know evolving a product any other examples people can share and how how does uh, backward compatibility complicate microservices world any thoughts yeah we'll uh, look at that uh, little later that is an important thing uh, so i will cover that little later yeah okay but i will uh, for now i will say that uh, backward compatibility is the ideal but in many cases you know people can't achieve backward compatibility so then they fall back into what is called versioning so you will notice uh, there are two versions of the api running in parallel version 1 and version 2 so version 1 clients will talk to version 1 of the api version 2 clients will talk to version 2 of the api but this is not the way backward compatibility is supposed to work okay any other interesting examples so there is one example here palm pilot you know which came out uh, in the 1990s so uh, it was uh, somewhat successful product uh, and uh, it was successful mainly because it had it was it had the ability to interwork with existing technologies instead of inventing in completely new interface what palm pilot did was it had the ability to hot sync with windows plus it was able to connect to uh, pc systems via use usb ports so by uh, making use of existing interfaces meaning that it was backward compatible with existing technologies uh, uh, vendors and users were able to adopt it more easily because their systems already were on windows they had uh, systems with usb ports so it was easier to interface but had palm pilot uh, invented this, uh, a completely new interface then uh, you know industry as a whole there will be some sort of an inertia to adopt this completely new technology any 
any other examples from your experience there are plenty of examples i'm sure i i think one thing that comes to my mind is um, uh, android um like play store yeah. when we get hold of uh, an app in let's say older android versions yeah um android 7 or 8 uh, beyond a point uh, you know the latest versions of android may not support it they'll say yeah yeah you either upgrade it or uh, yeah like yeah yeah uh, maybe you know many of us would have faced uh, yeah, an yeah. issue with that so yeah that's right i have a old uh, lollipop uh, which is android 5.0 Right, which I right. think is API level twenty one. Now right. some of the newer apps, uh, uh, they have a higher minimum. Hmm. Right. right. So I cannot install those apps on my phone because my phone is like uh, this. This came out in this API version came out in two thousand fourteen. That means eight years old. Right. Hmm. Hmm. So exactly what you mentioned. But there, Android is a much more interesting. Uh, ecosystem i will come, uh, we will discuss that shortly because there is also an aspect called forward compatibility in android right. mm. so that is what yeah. we are going to discuss any other examples people would like to share okay if not let's move on now let's come to the formal definition what is backward compatibility so we are i am showing you an example of a client server system so this is client and this is a server let's assume that the server is uh, and this is a previous version of the server and the next or future version of the server so let's assume that uh, you know uh, this is server version 1.0 and there are a number of clients designed for this server version and they are happily communicating one day uh, whoever is uh, managing this service they decide to upgrade the server to version 2.0 so what is backward compatibility backward compatibility says that uh, s is backward compatible to s minus 1 provided that all the clients that used to work with s minus 1 can work with s without doing any code change on the client side that means clients which used to work with 1.0 without doing any upgrade on their side they can straight away talk to server version 2.0 so when this kind of a thing is possible we say that server 2.0 is has been evolved in a backward compatible manner so it has moved from 1.0 to 2.0 in a backward compatible manner meaning that all the clients can now you know migrate to i mean can talk to version 2.0 without any problems so when this kind of a uh, uh, when backward compatibility is achieved like this you can understand you don't need to do api versioning you don't need to maintain api version 1.0 api version 2.0 that is not required because any request coming from the client the server will understand because it's been done in a backward compatible manner versioning is not required so this is what we mean by backward compatible okay then what is forward compatible uh, so what is forward compatible it is uh, kind of uh, it is looking into the future so we have a cl clients talking to this particular server version let's say uh, this is server 2.0 and all these clients have already migrated to 2.0 that means they 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 are all using all the latest features of 2.0 okay what forward compatibility guarantees is that it is looking into the future it says that the next version that is going to come out it will be designed in such a way that these clients can talk to uh, this particular server without doing any upgrade so uh, i mean it's a little tricky to understand but think of it this way forward compatibility is about looking into the future guaranteeing what will happen in the future and usually forward compatibility is hard to achieve because you don't know exactly how your api is going to evolve what kind of features you are going to provide but in industry forward compatibility it is not so common as backward compatibility but it exists there are many use cases where forward compatibility is important so uh, then there are sir two other related terms downward compatibility and upward compatibility so what uh, one paper is saying that if you look at this uh, 
diagram, you can see that the uh, terms backward and forward are applied with respect to a particular entity and two versions of that entity. So we don't say that client is backward compatible with the server. No, we don't say that. We don't say client is forward compatible with the server. What we are saying is one version of the server is backward compatible with the previous version. A version of the server is forward compatible with future versions. So the terms backward and forward are strictly used uh, across versions of the same entity, in this case server. Whereas the terms upward and downward, they are used between two different entities. So in this case, between client and server. So uh, to give you an example, uh, so you can see here, if the new version will continue, this is forward compatible, that's fine. Uh, so look at this statement. A server that's backward compatible implies that all old clients are upward compatible. So we already defined what is backward compatible. That means that all the clients which used to work with 1.0 can work with 2.0 without doing an upgrade. When this is possible because server has been evolved in a backward compatible manner, we say that the clients are upward compatible. So that is uh, what this definition says. A server that's upward backward compatible implies that all cl old clients are upward compatible. So you may not get the complete picture by uh, you know reading this brief statement here. So I encourage you to go to the reference. The reference paper has a much deeper discussion. So this is the reference paper from where you know this is properly explained. What is upward compatible? What it, what is downward compatible? And then it goes on to explain backward and forward compatible. Okay. So this paper gives a much deeper discussion of the terms. But in industry, nobody, uh, I mean, at least uh, in the, uh, yeah, mo most of the blogs that I have read, people are not very strict about these terms. They use these terms interchangeably. So when they, uh, for example, forward and upward, they use interchange, uh, sorry, backward and upward, they use interchangeably. Uh, so there is no consensus in the industry. But I found this paper to be con convincing and uh, the concepts are properly explained here. So those yeah, it's usually more, more details. You can read up this paper. Yeah, yeah we keep hearing a question. Go ahead. Uh, we keep hearing about uh, forward and backward compatibility a lot, not uh, maybe downward or upward so much. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you understand forward and backward, probably that is enough. Yeah. So to give you uh, some practical examples, here's a practical example. We already said, you know, new software can re read data in older formats. So that is considered as backward compatible. So for example, we spoke about Microsoft Office 2007. That can read older formats of Doc and XLS. So that means that the new software is backward compatible. It has been evolved from 2003 to 2007 in a backward compatible manner. But what is uh, forward compatible? It means exactly what uh, Rajan Agendra asked. So old software can read newer uh, formats. So that is called forward compatible. How is it possible? It is possible if the old software has been designed in such a way that fields that it doesn't understand, it will simply ignore. So older software is not going to throw up its hands and say, I don't understand this format. The format has been uh, the old software is written in such a way that uh, you know it can read the new formats, but it will simply ignore fields it doesn't know, and the rest of the fields it understands. Uh, that is enough for it to uh, open the newer formats. But in practice, this is actually very hard to achieve. So as I pointed out, uh, even in Microsoft Office, they have not uh, attempted to achieve forward compatibility because. When they designed uh, uh, Office 2003, they would not have thought what will be the next big format. How future versions of Office, uh, what kind of formats they will use. They, they would not have foreseen that. That is why they kind of achieved forward compatibility by giving a patch to Office 2003. That is the way they, they did it. Okay. 
but there is another much more beautiful example of forward compatibility, which is with Android SDK. And uh, I don't know how many of you are Android developers, but uh, yeah, probably Naveen is an Android developer. And uh, you can also give your uh, observations. So in no, Android no, SDK, so SDK doesn't guarantee backward compatibility. Android SDK, but what Android SDK guarantees is that it is forward compatible. So what does it mean to say that Android SDK is forward compatible? So let's say today I design an app with API level 22. Let's assume that is a particular API level I am using in my app and I have uh, uh, compiled it for that. And probably, uh, you know, that is the latest API available at the time. So today I'm releasing the app to the app store. I'm compiling it with the latest API. Let's assume that it is API 22. But two months later, a new Android version comes up and uh, new phones are released in the market. But I have not bothered to update my API, uh, my app rather. So my, because maybe I have moved on to different projects, it doesn't matter. So my app is still using the old API, API 22. But newer API versions have come out, uh, newer phones have come out. Will these newer phones be able to install this old app? That is the question. So Android SDK guarantees this by making the SDK forward compatible, which means that newer phones can also install the older apps. So my app, although it was designed for API 22, it was compiled against API level 22, and my latest phone, it may be having uh, the latest SDK and API level 30, let's say. But it hardly matters because Android guarantees forward compatibility. That means even though my app is built with uh, 22, the SDK evolves in a forward compatible manner. So the app can still run on the newest phones. So that is what Android SDK guarantees. So Android SDK is a... Uh, very important example. It is not backward compatible, rather it is forward compatible. And now you may wonder, uh, we already said forward compatible in practice, it's hard to achieve. How is it possible? So in the case of Android SDK, APIs are deprecated, but they are never removed. That is why, you know, you can always use an old app on a new phone. So between API level 22 and API level 30, Maybe there are a lot of uh, interfaces which are deprecated, but in API level 30, they will not remove those interfaces. They will continue to keep those interfaces. And this is because they want to guarantee forward compatibility, and that is the reason for that. They don't want to break old apps. Because there, there is a commercial uh, incentive, right? because apps are expensive to build and uh, more than the hardware, more than the Android OS, the real value add in the whole ecosystem is the apps and the app store. So once an app is released into the app store, you want the value of that app to be utilized forever if possible. So the way to achieve this is forward compatibility. So even on the latest phones, old apps sh should be usable. This is not to what we were discussing a little earlier with uh, uh, Naveen chipping in. Earlier, we were discussing the opposite. That is, in old phones, new apps may not work. That is an issue of back backward compatibility. But now we are talking about the opposite, where old apps should be usable on the latest phones. Any questions, comments, or thoughts on this? So with this example of Android SDK, you know, the idea of forward compatibility becomes easier to understand. Any comments or thoughts? Yeah, in, in terms of um, a device also, hardware plays a role here. Maybe the older version of hardware may not support some new um, features so it makes sense that um, you know like uh, some android versions um, like some phones are allowed to not upgrade beyond the particular android version so it is practical to 
uh, I mean, it is also limited by the hardware. Some yeah, yeah. phones are not forward compatible because they are using an older hardware, older version of Android. Yeah. Uh, any any insights on uh, with reference to JVM evolution? JVM, uh, I, I'm not sure. It will be backward compatible. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I I, I didn't uh, research on that yeah. example, but yeah, I can include it in this article because uh, some more work is pending in this article. I can include it. Yeah, because I think yeah, Sun actually, I mean, many people liked it because I think the first 20 years or so, they made it backward compatible. Some good mm -hmm. history was there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's backward compatible, I guess. Yeah. That's one of the, the longest. Even CSS standard, which we use on the web, the standard has always evolved in a backward compatible manner. So what it means is that uh, uh, web pages which are co coded 20 years ago, they will continue to work on modern browsers. Right. So what are the different types of backward compatibility? There are a few. Uh, People have identified few different types. Source compatibility means that the software compiles even when some dependents have been updated to a newer version. So this is mainly at the compilation level, source compatibility. Then there is binary compatibility. So it's not just compilation, but it can also link to newer components. So that is a binary compatibility. When it comes to protocols, we talk about wire compatibility. So that means at the the way bits are encoded. So that is what we mean by wire compatibility. And this also applies applies, for example, to protocol buffers, which uh, you know, which is a standard widely used uh, in, in the open source community as well as in Google. So protocol buffers, uh, you know, when message types are evolved, you should make sure that they are wire compatible. That means uh, the way bits. Uh, no extra bit should be added. If an extra bit is added, then the decoder will get confused. So it, it will break the backward compatibility. So that is uh, called wire compatibility. So uh, that's what is explained here. Then uh, at the final stage, we have something called semantic compatibility. So which is that uh, despite all these things, you know, there can still be problems when to entities are interacting because they understand the messages differently. That is, uh, you know, the semantics have been changed. So that should not happen. Right? Semantics should be preserved. I will give you a simple example where semantics are changed uh, because of a wrong update. Let's say you have defined uh, enumeration. Let's say maybe in your my MySQL schema, you have defined an enumeration. And uh, in a later version of the database schema, you have not added any new enumerations or neither have you removed anything, but you have changed the order of the enum values. This will completely break the semantic compatibility because now the enum values stored in the old records, now suddenly they have a new meaning because you have changed your schema in an incompatible manner. So this is what we mean by breaking the semantic compatibility. Then there is another aspect. See, typically when we talk about backward compatibility, we are talking about different evolutions of the same product. What we saw in this diagram, the server evolves 1.0, 2.0 to the future, 3.0. That is what we mean by backward compatible. Different versions of the same product or protocol or standard. But there is another kind of backward compatibility called uh, at the technology layer. So uh, we saw an example of this with the Palm Pilot, where you know Palm Pilot is able to interwork with the Microsoft Windows and you make use of USB ports. So that's an example of uh, backward compatibility at the technology layer. Something similar is also there. Another example of that is CSS. See, when CSS was first designed, what is CSS? Cascaded Style Sheet. Style sheet are typically stored uh, in a separate tag called style, or it can be stored in a separate document, .css document. 
But you know, before CSS came out, people used to do styling directly in the HTML tags. That is inline, they used to do the styling. So what does it mean? Does it mean that when CSS uh, is implemented, this will no longer work? But that is not the case. Even when CSS came out, the old styling continues to work. That means you can still, developers are still allowed to use direct styling in their HTML tags. This is what we mean by backward compatibility at the technology layer. Just because CSS has been released as the new shiny tool, it should not invalidate the old ways of working. So the old ways of working should continue uh, so that you know developers have the maximum. They don't have to rewrite their HTML documents. That, that is the fundamental point here. So these are the different, uh, broadly different types of backward compatibility. Uh, so another important question to be answered is what are the main techniques? So all that uh, so far we have covered, we have understood how to achieve backward. I mean, how what backward compatibility is, what forward compatibility is. But practically, if you are a developer, if you are maintaining an API or a library, how do you ensure that whatever you do is going to be backward compatible? Actually, it is not very difficult if you follow few simple rules. So the rules are all given here. So when adding new interfaces or new, uh, uh, you can achieve backward compatibility uh, when you are adding new interfaces or new operations to existing interfaces or new optional parameters to existing operations. So in either of these uh, cases, it will continue to be backward compatible because what we are doing, you are only making things additive. You are adding things rather than deleting or removing. So if you do anything else, you know, there is a chance that you will break uh, backward compatibility. For example, you should not change the order of enumeration values. You should not remove or rename operations. Or you should not add mandatory parameters to existing operations. Right? Because the older uh, clients will not work because they will not have this mandatory parameter. So these are some of the simple rules uh, you have to follow. Don't change the semantics. We discussed this. And don't make your input validation more restrictive. Maybe in the old version, you know, your inputs was allowed between 1 and 10. In the new version, suddenly you put a restriction. Inputs are only between 1 and 5. This will break backward compatibility. Suddenly, old clients which are using inputs in the range of 5 to 10, they will start failing. So that is what we mean by don't make your inputs more restrictive. So whatever semantics was designed in the previous version, that should be preserved. So avoid versioning. So we spoke about this uh, briefly. So typically when people, uh, especially with APIs, uh, when new changes occur to the APIs, people will introduce version 1, version 2 of the APIs. Uh, it's actually an, uh, not an elegant solution, but people do this because probably they have no other choice. The changes have become so much that it becomes difficult to evolve the older API. So the only way to do it is through versioning. And in versioning, what happens? You have to run multiple versions of the API in parallel on your server side. And then you have to gracefully retire the older versions. So at some point you will say, OK, most of my clients are using. Uh, you know, version uh, 2.0 only maybe 5% of my clients are using version 1.0. So I will now retire. You know, I don't need to maintain a server just to run. Uh, uh, maintain version one just for these 5% of the clients. So I may decide from a business perspective to retire the older versions. So this is, uh, uh, you know, about versioning. Uh, then there is something which is very common. Uh, those of us who are working with protocols, you will know this, uh, uh, which is very common in communi uh, communication protocols. There is something called negoti uh, negotiating the versions. So let's say a client is talking to the server. They will first negotiate what version do you support? So the client will say, I support version, uh, you know, I support HTTP 1.1, HTTP 2.0, HTTP 3.0. Then the server will decide. Uh, then the server will take a look and say, OK, this client uh, is supporting HTTP 3.0. Uh, 
So let me serve the files in HTTP 3.0. So that is called negotiating. So some people call this as the etiquette standard. So this is one. I mean, this is not exactly uh, backward compatibility, but this is practical. Uh, you know, versioning and then this kind of negotiations. They are used in many practical systems because uh, it's not possible to evolve things always in a backward compatible manner. So that is the reason you know these kind of uh, approaches are being adopted in the industry. The last point is what is the cost of making technology backward compatible? So uh, we have seen all the advantages of backward compatibility, but there is a kind of a dark lining to it, let's say. So one of the things we said already touched upon is we have to maintain uh, multiple versions. You know, if you, things are not done properly in backward compatible. But the real point is that, uh, yeah, so uh, earlier uh, Rajan Agendra was asking. In the world of microservices, what happens? So in the world of microservices, uh, it's very common to maintain multiple versions of the API. And the older versions are deprecated, but uh, clients will continue to use them for a long period of time. Now, uh, so one study has shown that this actually creates a technical debt. Uh, debt particularly for integration testing, because now you have to test not only for uh, new versions of the API, but also maintain old versions of the API. And uh, uh, the effort from both the development and maintenance is duplicated. So in the, the end result is if you have to uh, make some changes, it takes longer. So that is what we mean by technical debt. Because now you are maintaining multiple versions of the same API. So this is a big problem in the microservices world uh, because you can't always evolve the API in a backward compatible manner. So you end up with multiple versions. So that is what is also uh, you know represented here in the diagram. Another big uh, uh, discussion in uh, literature is backward compatibility actually comes in the way of innovation because you continue to prolong the life of older technologies. Take for example, IPv4. IPv4 was supposed to be retired long ago, right? Maybe 20, 25 years ago. Still, even today, even though many systems are IPv6, many systems continue to operate on IPv4 because of this uh, requirement of backward compatibility. It was not possible to switch everybody to IPv6. We have to only switch gradually. But the complete switch to IPv6 never happened. People are still using IPv4. Another example is uh, Sony's uh, PlayStation uh, 3. Now, PlayStation 3 was designed to be backward compatible with PlayStation 1 and 2. Now, the design of uh, you know the technology behind PlayStation 3 is actually very different from the earlier generations. But to make it backward compatible, they, they had to actually add extra hardware within the hardware of PlayStation 3. The end result is the solution is actually more expensive, both for vendors and consumers. So sometimes, you know, we can say that, you know, making things backward compatible is, uh, you know, maybe a great thing, but there are costs involved in this case. The cost is not just for the vendor, but it is also passed on to the consumer because the product is more expensive. Another interesting example which I came across in the research is that uh, why did Europeans invent GSM? The GSM is the what we call commonly as uh, 2G, right? So that is GSM, cellular standard. Why, why didn't the Americans uh, invent uh, GSM? What uh, and wh wh why is it that the Europeans took the lead? So the thing is in Europe, there were because Europe is uh, having so many small countries and each country had a different uh, cellular standard. That is we are talking about before GSM in the 1980s. And because there was there were various standards in different European countries. Uh, when they decided to come up with a digital cellular standard, they said, let's not make it backward compatible. Let's invent something completely new. 
so that is why europeans were not constrained by uh, whatever they had earlier they so this freed them from uh, the constraint of backward compatibility and they invented something really good and uh, it was so good that gsm became uh, the de facto standard for the entire world even in the us who were using uh, cdma standard they eventually migrated to uh, gsm so that is what uh, you know so this is one of the criticism of backward compatibility it can prolong existing technologies and come in the way of innovation backward compatibility can also lead to less efficient solutions so there is a study uh, g722 is a uh, audio codec uh, what is an audio codec it basically describes the rules how audio should be encoded and decoded in terms of bits and bytes before it is transmitted or stored so that is what uh, this codec specifies so now this codec uh, evolves obviously this is also not static the standards evolve uh, actually sudhir will be familiar he is from the audio uh, encoding side so this standard was evolved to support super wideband now uh, it was evolved in a backward compatible manner but somebody did a study and showed that suppose they had designed the standard in a non backward compatible manner then the efficiency of the codec codec would have been higher okay so this is just an example to show that backward compatibility maybe it is required because practically this there is no other way but we just have to be aware that backward compatibility can lead to less efficient solutions okay now uh, the history of backward compatibility is very interesting i have not uh, written this uh, fully probably by end of today i will complete this section and uh, maybe tomorrow you can read it up uh, it's a very uh, interesting history one of the most interesting examples is uh, color television and i have uh, listed this as an example so color television first came out in the 1950s and uh, you know when color television came out uh, there are already millions of tv sets out in the world they are all black and white television sets so just because suddenly your station switched to broadcasting in color uh, it doesn't mean that suddenly all uh, black and white tv sets will become obsolete so the people who designed color television they were really uh, careful to ensure that it would be backward compatible with the existing you know, black and white television sets and the technique they use very interesting so if you read about this this itself is a big investigation how they managed to achieve that but bottom line is they figured out that information can be decomposed into two things luminance and chrominance this is the most important thing insight and luminance is much more important for the human eye that means brightness is much more important to capture the fine details of an image than the color so which is why when they did the uh, spectrum allocation much more spectrum is allocated to transmitting the luminance you see this entire spectrum is allocated to carrying the luminance whereas chrominance gets only very small amount of spectrum so these are and it is done in a backward compatible manner meaning that when the uh, black and white television receives that it will completely ignore the chrominance bands side bands it will only look at the luminance it will extract the luminance component but in term, so the, so the intelligence is in the way it is modulated but if you look at the time signal the time signal is modulated with both luminance and chrominance but you can separate them out in the frequency domain so uh, uh, existing black and white televisions of the 1950s they were even though they were receiving color modulated signals they were able to display a proper black and white image so this is one of the success stories in uh, back, backward compatibility another success story is microsoft's xbox one so in 2015 they announced this uh, program called xbox one backward compatibility so there are hundreds of games written for the original xbox and xbox 360 and gamers were very much uh, pissed off because 
whenever a new version of xbox comes that is hardware comes out all the old games will become obsolete that means you can't run the old games on the new hardware so that is why when microsoft announced uh, 2015 uh, this backward compatibility program it was a big uh, news for developer uh, gamers uh, over all over the world what it means original xbox and xbox 360 games can now run on newer xbox one consoles not only that in later versions these these are the latest xbox uh, consoles series x and series s they are by design backward compatible that means uh, older games can run on these newer consoles and this also has the added advantage that you can preserve older games so you don't have to worry uh, whether new hardware will be able to run older games so backward compatibility by design ensures that older games uh, are always usable by gamers on the newest hardware so these are uh, just two examples i captured uh, you know for the timeline but uh, the history of backward compatibility is much more interesting so i hope to complete this section by end of today so then uh, yeah you will get a much more complete history of this topic so i hope you found the session interesting uh, and uh, any thoughts and comments you can share it now definitely arvin i think we have to keep that in mind whenever um, we create an api or uh, create an application like making sure how it behaves um, when uh, when we upgrade when the platform upgrades or when the clients uh, make some changes um, so uh, yeah i think it's uh, it's very important to be aware of uh, how um compatible our uh, designs are so I, I, it's a lovely discussion so talking about apis uh, you know uh, of course th this is one of the most important uh, points of discussion today because uh, all products uh, use apis to some extent and especially if you are using uh, things on the cloud or building cloud native apps uh, definitely uh, you know apis play a central role in your product so there is a lot of published material about apis and since navin brought out the point i will share this on the screen this is google's uh, design guidelines to make apis uh, backward compatible so read this this will give you uh, uh, a quick overview but we have already covered this in our discussion so to summarize adding a new api interface is not a problem adding a new method to an existing interface is not a problem adding a field to a message is not a problem right adding a http binding to a method is not a problem adding a new enum value is not a problem so all this will keep it backward compatible what is a problem removing or renaming something that is a problem changing the bindings right so it will uh, create problems changing the field type changing the resource name so these things are all breaking behavior changing the url format breaking behavior right, right? so for example uh, your url was like this earlier shelves shelf number books book number then you suddenly changed it to shelves shelf id books and book id right now this is a breaking change right. so there are so this so like this this is just one example from google but there are many more examples online uh, on how to uh, evolve your apis in a backward compatible manner very nice any I'm, other questions uh, or comments Okay, so then. is it uh, really really related to technology or even usability of an application, especially SaaS applications? Look and feel, workflow. 
Yeah, see, uh, when a product is evolved, it can evolve in many directions, right? For different reasons. So maybe previous version was not uh, had poor usability, and then in the new version they decided, okay, they are going to change a few things. But it should not. It should be done in a backward compatible manner. Uh, I don't know what you mean by usability and backward compatible. They are not directly somebody, related. Somebody was uh, very used to using, let's say, SAP version and XYZ, and then you know tomorrow SAP comes out with totally a different UI and different way of doing things. Right, right. So yeah, there I don't think people use the term backward compatibility. Because here there is a human component involved, right? When you talk about usability. Right. In, in these cases, uh, people expect that the users will uh, unlearn and re relearn the new interface. Okay. Because, because it's going to enhance their overall uh, user experience. So that is why those changes have been made. So on that basis, uh, that is, I mean, that is my understanding. But from uh, the way yeah, I don't think people uh, think about that in that perspective. Yeah, yeah and, and in some cases it may not be possible also, like uh, in case of uh, like GSM is a very good example. If you had, um, I mean, if you had thought about um, just supporting the older system, mm -hmm. sometimes it may not be possible to do something new. So mm -hmm. it's again, uh, I think it's a, uh, conscious choice that we make and at the same time when we make that leap we'll have to make sure you know all the older systems and older integrations are uh, taken care of or you know just uh, leave them away and run away from them yeah. so uh, can you see my screen uh You can see my screen. I hope. Hello. Yeah, yeah, Arvind. Okay, I can see this. So just to add to what you have said, I also mentioned earlier. I wanted to show an example. So you talked about GSM, but I am giving an example from 5G. 5G is nothing more than a evolution of GSM. Now in 5G, there are uh, different releases. So for example, everything that is uh, colored in uh, this yellow, they were added in release 16. Okay, so release 16 is a particular, uh, let's say what we call commonly as version in other lingo. This is in uh, 5G, we call it a release 16. Whereas all the other fields that you see in other colors, they were existing in an earlier release, which is release 15. Now, how did 5G ensure that this particular change, whatever changes they have done in release 16, how did they ensure that they are done in a backward compatible manner? So let's uh, uh, see what they have done. First of all, you see this column here, this relates to a certain format. So in this format, one bit is transmitted, two bits, four, two, three. So these are the bits these are the fields and these fields have so many bits. And this is how transmission happens uh, when it goes on the air interface. So this is preserved and this is how it was in release 15 and uh, this has not been changed because if you change this, it will break backward compatibility. So existing things should not change. So th that applies for this format, it applies for this format and this format. So all these are backward compatible because nothing has changed. OK, now let's look at. Uh, uh, let's look at, sorry, uh, I, I won't say nothing has changed. There is a change here. Yeah, so DCI format 11. Yeah, we have not discussed this. Now let's look at DCI format 11, which was already existing in release 15 and it continues to exist in release 16. But in release 16, extra fields have been added. So one, two, three, four, four fields have been added. Now, uh, does it break backward compatibility? No, it has been designed in such a way that it doesn't break backward compatibility. And you can see it in the bit allocation. You can see that each of these fields, it can be zero bits. That means when this is transmitted, when this format is transmitted to an older mobile, 
it will take the form of transmitting zero bits. But when it is transmitted to a newer mobile which supports release 16 and supports these newer features, then these extra bits will be encoded. So this is how the standard has ensured that uh, the change to this format is done in a backward compatible manner by making the new fields optional. But suppose you had not made it optional. Suppose you said that instead of 0 slash 1, you say that this has to be one bit. Then this will not be a backward compatible change because suddenly now you cannot transmit this format to older mobiles. Because you will always transmit this extra bit. And older mo mo mobiles will stop working. They will not understand this extra bit. Right? So that is uh, how they have ensured that it is uh, backward compatible. Then you add new formats. Now again, this is not a problem because it is not about modifying existing formats. Rather, it is adding a new format. So now uh, this new format will never be received by an older mobile, which is on release 15. Because as I explained earlier, typically in 5G protocols, there will be a negotiation happening. And during that negotiation, uh, the network will understand what is the release that the mobile supports. And according to that, it will uh, know what it should send and what it should, short, it should not send. So this new fo uh, format will be used exclusively for release 16 mobiles and the same thing for this. So this is the way backward compatibility can be achieved practically. So to summarize, existing formats are not changed. Existing format is changed in a backward compatible manner by including only new optional fields. Then new formats are introduced which will not be used for older mobiles. So this is again a practical example of how it is done, uh, you know, in communication protocols.